This, oh, it is on. I can tell it's on. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. This is really exciting to have you here. Um, does this sound okay? I know it's a little echoey. Can everyone hear me okay? Fantastic. All right. Well, my name is Lana Selby. I'm the executive director here at UConstruct, and I just wanted to say a few words of welcome before I hand it over. Uh, we're just so thrilled to have you all, many of you in person. There's also many of you online, watching online, so that's really exciting. Uh, and to start, I really wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that uh, we're honored and we're really grateful every day to do the work that we do and have these conversations that we're having on the traditional territories of the Kwanlin Dunn First Nation and the Tong Kwachin Council. We love that we can bring people together and have these conversations. It's a really important thing for us and the goal is really to spark ideas um, and there's going to be, I think, a lot of wisdom and advice shared tonight and that's really the driving core of our Entrepreneur Speaker Series. Uh, we know that, you know, Yukoners, um, Yukoners are so innovative, they are so creative, and it's really important to us that we foster and facilitate their ideas and opportunities to start businesses, to move forward passions, and to really get things up and running. And one of the things we do here at UConstruct is we offer one-on-one -on -one business support. Um, we have a fantastic collaborative co-working space. We have a maker space. We do startup boot camps every year. If you want to learn more, please don't hesitate. Look at our website. It's youconstruct.com. Reach out to us. We're really, really passionate about getting ideas up and running. And just a couple of thank yous before I hand it over. I just really want to acknowledge and thank you, Neil, for being here with us tonight. It's thank you for sharing your journey. I know we have a lot to learn. And, and of course, John, thank you for facilitating and bringing this conversation to life. And uh, La Petite Maison for catering. Fantastic. I hope everyone has enjoyed the crepes. Uh, and of course, Yukon Brewing for the beer. Always. Thank you so much. And a final huge thank you to the Hogan's, Ralph and Marge Hogan, uh, Eric, Kim, Miles and Tanner. The Hogan's have been sponsoring this Entrepreneur Speaker Series for many years. And I know that that has sparked a lot of inspiration for a lot of Yukoners. So uh, my final, final comment and what I hope you take away from tonight is running a business is challenging. I probably hear about some challenges. There's a lot of ups and downs, but uh, it can also be really rewarding and we're here to help. So please reach out to us. And with that, I will, I'll let John take it away. Thanks everyone for being here. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lana, and thank you everyone for being here. Uh, my name is John Glamouris. I'm thrilled to be here with Neil, not just because we share the same haircut, but <laughs> because uh, Neil, Neil might forget this, but um, I used to live in Halifax, and years ago before moving here, I actually read an article about Neil, and absolutely the, your story and the story of your passion for the North is one of the reasons I moved here. So I owe you a thanks from that perspective. Um, I also want to thank you, Construct, for, for hosting this. Um, I love your mission. I love that we get to do these kind of things, and we get to dig deep and find some inspiration to continue all the amazing things that happen here. So I know many of our audience probably know Neil, um, but I want to read um, your bio, and I don't mean to embarrass you, but I want to give folks a bit of scaffolding on exactly who Neil is. So Neil is an adventure outfitter. He's a guide, author, educator, and northern tourism icon. His business, Nahani River Adventures and Canadian River Expeditions, operated 12-day expeditions on 20 spectacular rivers across the north and in western Canada, employing up to 50 staff and serving, this is my favorite part, 10,000 person meals per season, all caught, cooked over a campfire or stove in remote locations. That says a lot. <laughs> Clients included the rich and famous as well as those who stay for years for a trip of a lifetime. 
Neil describes his sector as adventurous wilderness tourism. National Geographic magazine named your business one of the best adventure travel companies on the planet. And the company has won many awards. And Neil, I understand you're a fellow of the Royal Geographic Society. Um, I understand you began operating your business in 1984. You moved here in 1992. Um, you sold your business in 2018 after 34 years of great stories, many lessons, and the business of adventure. So today, Neil continues to be a leader of and champion for Yukon's tourism sector and consults in the business of adventure, particularly for Yukon operators. So Neil, thanks again for being here. I'm really excited to, uh, to dive in with you. Thank you, John. So, oh, so what? But first, but first, we have a surprise, don't we, for our audience? Yes, okay. yes. Yeah. So folks, I want you to imagine that you have just won a trip with Neil, and Neil is going to take you on a visual extravaganza to give you a sense of exactly what his tours are all about. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Neil. Thanks, John. Yeah, this is our, 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 our uh, shared uh, haircut. And, uh, and, and this, uh, the, the hat is my uniform, actually. It's the one thing that was always consistent in my, uh, my uh, dressing uh, in my career. Uh, I'm told it's not the greatest for video with the uh, lights above and so forth, so uh, um, I may uh, scrap it. Uh, shortly. But um, w one of the, as, as um, John has said, um, we're going to uh, go down um, uh, three rivers today um, just to get, just in, to start. And because uh, one of the defining elements of, uh, that was so critical with, um, with the product that my business offered was the visual appeal. And, um, you know, words just don't do it. I learned that uh, early on. And a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, a video is probably, a moving picture is worth even more. Um, but um, uh, uh, to give you a sense of the grandeur of these places that, um, that we offered to, to uh, take people to, um, we're, we're going to uh, do a slide show. And, um, Normally, I would do a 90-minute show to present, you know, our full offering to people. But um, uh, don't worry, I've trimmed this down quite a bit so that uh, we can cover some other things as well. But uh, it will, will give you a sense. And. Um, I, I uh, may break through the fourth wall from time to time because this is a talk about the business of adventure as opposed to me pitching uh, 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 trips. And um, so I'll be giving you uh, more behind the, the scenes uh, throughout the evening, but uh, even in the, in the slideshow. And um, just uh, some background on, on uh, what, why Nahanni River Adventures and Canadian River Expeditions. And if I could have had the name Canadian River Expeditions when I registered the name of my company originally, I would have taken it very happily, but someone else had it. And they'd had it since 1972. Uh, his name was Big John Micus, and he started Canadian River Expeditions. It was the first river expedition company in uh, Canada uh, of its kind, and um, it, it was tremendous. And John had one thing that most of us who start out um, in, this, in this business don't have, and that was money. And um, so what he, and he, he'd been to the Grand Canyon with his young son, Johnny, and um, he, um, was so inspired by it and realized he was from British Columbia and he said, geez, we could be doing this in British Columbia. Nobody's doing this. So he went home and he hired the people that he went on in the, on the Grand Canyon trip with to set him up. And they came and they trained guides. They bought all the, the gear and everything. And his instructions were only the best. I want all the best equipment and so forth. Very different from the start of my company. Uh, <laughs> but um, anyhow, long story short, 30 years, 40 years later, um, his company had changed hands a few few times and was on the market and um, I uh, gleefully uh, acquired it and um, and and but because the name um, works so well especially outside of Canada where people don't necessarily uh, understand the name Nahani they do understand Canadian River Expedition so I wanted to keep both brands alive and I had invested so much in the Nahani one that uh, I kept it as well.
So um, on this map, I don't know if you can see, um, but uh, the blue rivers are the ones, that, the blue lines are the rivers that we operated on, over 20 different rivers uh, across the north, right from Alaska to the Eastern Arctic to uh, Baffin Island, the Soper River. And um, uh, we, uh, but the, our roots are the beginning, we're on the, the Nahanni River. I'm pronouncing it Nahanni. Um, the, um, I guess my measure for some, we often pronounce it Nahani, and um, but the name of the village, the First Nations village on the river is Nahani Butte. That's how the locals pronounce it. So I think that's a pretty good key. Although the Naha people who inhabited the upper part of the river, we refer to themselves as Naha. So Nahani, Nahani, either one works. Uh, and it's a, it's a stunning uh, landscape, very diverse, and um, uh, the uh, is it going on its own or is it, did I, did I, anyhow uh, a great many attractions. It's a photographer's paradise. And um, uh, 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 are you moving it? No, no, I don't think so. I, I maybe it's a it's sensitive, but. Unlike on the river where nothing ever goes sideways, yeah. Neil's being thrown off his game right now. Yeah, this is, and this is common, I, I have to say. Even with the old days uh, when I would uh, use slide projectors, you remember the slides, you know, when they were actually a real thing? Uh, that's right. And uh, I would, um, uh, I tried to aspire to uh, a dissolve unit so that, you know, you'd have a fancy soft dissolve. And so, which that required two projectors and this very, um, I learned very fickle gizmo that would, and expensive, that would dissolve them. And um, oh man, that caused me so much grief. And uh, then I went to, um, I was at a presentation at the Banff Festival of Mountain Films where uh, they had someone like Rick who was a specialist in dealing with this stuff and you know could work magic um, with uh, any anything technical. And even there, the, the projectors got all out of sequence and, and, and I think they adjourned the session for a while while they figured it out and everything. I thought, you know, if, if this, if this uh, um, guru of, uh, of, of, of technology can't fix it, then I, I, I'm, I, I don't stand a chance. Anyhow, I'm glad you're here, Rick. <laughs> uh, photographer's paradise and uh, all manner of, uh, of, of wildlife and um, uh, cultural uh, stories. And, and uh, past, this is uh, up on the Burnside River, uh, traditional tents and um, uh, Arctic char uh, drying. So we use the canoe to, um, to, to move through um, down these rivers. I'm not doing that, um, but that's okay. Um, <clears throat> If I back it up, and and um, and then uh, g uh, gradually um, uh, included uh, raft expeditions, all as a ve as vehicles to move through the landscape. So um, it was part of the experience to to, uh, to paddle a canoe on canoe trips or or to float in rafts, and. Um, but there was much, much more than that. That that was um, it was very different from the the weekend warrior experience where people would go for a weekend of whitewater thrills and chills. Um, it, this was um, uh, a much um, deeper immersion into into the landscape and an opportunity to move from place to place and explore and hike and and so forth and and get to know each other and ourselves and. Um, uh, so the, uh, the, the, the that was the common thread was those craft um, here, and hiking was uh, a very important part. This is uh, Alsec, or sorry, Lowell Lake on the on the Alsec River. Um, you you get um, so many great opportunities to to get to high places. So we're going to start out on the, the Nahanni River, and um, I, I had read about this as a teenager when I was uh, uh, a young teenager, and this it was a book called Nahanni by Dick Turner, and it described this larger than life land that um, you know at the time it was it was so grand his descriptions of it were so grand and uh, probably actually understated after I'd gone there uh, to see but I I honestly couldn't see myself ever going there it was just so big and so um, almost untouchable um, so that was my for for years my it, it brewed around in, in the back of my mind and I would hear of others who would go on a basically on a, on a pilgrimage to the Nahanni
And so this is one of the landmark uh, uh, features, uh, Virginia Falls, nearly twice the height of Niagara, Nali Cho in uh, southern Tushone. And um, it's, uh, it's a captivating place. You could spend weeks just, um, just absorbing uh, this place. Uh, this is the twin otter that we commonly use to fly in. And, and, and that was one of, the, one of the real attractions, I think, for our guests was that, that these places were so remote that they were, in most cases, uh, you either uh, used the, they used the um, aircraft to access or to egress or both. And, um, and so you knew that you were going to a place where few others were and that was, uh, was, was challenging to get to. And um, incidentally, um, the Twin Otter costs more per mile to, cha to charter than a Learjet. And um, there, there was uh, years where, well, years we spent between uh, a quarter of a million, half a million dollars just on plane charters alone. And so it gives you a sense of, um, you know. I think what's happening is is this industry is embarrassed of the price tag it wants to move on. <laughs> yeah, Don't on. tell them it's more expensive than <laughs> a Learjet. Right. Yes, that's right. And I normally, in a slideshow, I wouldn't be telling that you this information, but because it's business oriented, we this is why I am. Thanks, thanks, John. That explanation um, has has Canada's deepest river canyons. Oops, um, and uh, there, uh, four for a series of four canyons. Uh, unique geological features. This is Rabbit Kettle Hot Springs. Um, it's about the size. It's a it's a mound of calcium. That's beautiful, ornate features about the size of a half the size of a football field. And that vent in the middle, the people are standing around. Um, that has uh, it's a hot spring. It's, it's actually a tepid spring, but um, doesn't freeze in the winter. Uh, and it, it is a gorgeous place. But you. You, um, if you go there, you have to take your shoes off to go up on that mound. It's so delicate. It's also a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and uh, this is the Cirque of the Unclimbables. It's a it's a granite intrusion, uh, molten magma that pushed through the surface of the earth. And um, this is Dead Man Valley, that is also a key part of the attraction because. It was here at the turn of the century. It's a beautiful place, but it was also at the turn of the century where um, two prospecting brothers, Frank and Willie McLeod, were uh, uh, found dead and headless. And so that day when they were found, the valley, that mountain ringed valley, was named uh, Dead Men Valley, and the surrounding mountains were named Funeral Range, Burial Range, and, and so it goes. Hey Neil, I'm not Headless I'm range. not a tech guy. Yep. But I'm just wondering if you if it's just sensitive, if you just keep your thumb off of it. I don't think it's me that's doing it. I think you it's know? the timer. Yeah, there's I think it's uh, in the background. Give me a sec. I'll see if I can turn off the timer. Thank you. Yeah, that's what's happening. It's it's. It's um, got a mind of its own. And what I kind of love about some, and I've, I've had the pleasure to see this, but what I kind of love about these photos is, as you said, like it's, it's really hard to put the context into words. And I love, I love these images because for me, uh, I've not had the pleasure to be in any of these kind of landscapes, but there's something inspiring. And, and I love that image you told in the beginning of reading a book. Is it Dick Smith? Uh, Dick Turner. And you should have to wonder what happened if you didn't pick up that book. Yeah, I know, and it was a gift actually. Uh, yeah, and it was it was. Well, um, it was the gift of a lifetime. Uh, and I, I had a few gifts of a lifetime along the way, but uh, uh, that one uh, most certainly was. How's it going, Rick? Um, I think we'll have to suffer on. Yeah, that's and a, some I, slides are set up to. Yeah. Move on their own. I think we're. I sense that we have a um, a very patient uh, audience, and so I, I think that we're going to be okay. Uh, we did that, talk about Deman Valley and um, and uh, Canada's deep. Oh, wrong way. Canada's <laughs> Canada's deepest. This, uh, uh, you know, I'll tell you uh, another story uh, about the business of adventure. I was uh, doing this exact show at a, um, a conference room in, uh, in on uh, Manhattan Island in New York, and uh, in the uh, um, Hyatt Hotel, and um, it was on Memorial Day, and they, clearly most of their staff had called in sick, 
and I couldn't get the lights to turn off in this room. And this is all about clarity of you know the best pictures possible. And they were just it was not going to work. So finally, out of desperation, they kept saying they'd send somebody down to turn off the lights. They never did. And um, so I pulled up tables, stacked up tables, climbed up on top, and they had these pot lights that I I put taped my brochures over <laughs> to to, and so it was great. It was perfect. The light was just right until I started to smell smoke. <laughs> and and, uh, I, I, and it, you know the fire department might have uh, called in sick too. So I I, I, I I then had to scramble, get the help of the audience to tear all these things down before I set the Hyatt Hotel on fire. So I, I this is nothing. This is this is child's play. This, and that, look at it, it's sitting there, it's obeying now. Yeah. Um, so uh, it, it, it's, um, uh, this is at a place called uh, The Gate, and um, uh, it's a, a great hike. And you can see from the, these people here are very representative of those that would come. They're baby boomers, and um, uh, that was our cohort throughout 35 years. Uh, um, we started with baby boomers when they were <clears throat> in their late 20s and 30s, and uh, average age, I think Joel, who is per Joel Hibbard, who, who uh, now runs the company, um, their average age is 59 or 60. So it, it just like the democracy said what happened, it, it is textbook. It's a textbook case. So, yeah, talking about the hiking and, the, and of course, uh, the white water. And um, it, uh, it, the white water portions were, um, again, it was just something to add spice to the river, whether it was, uh, the, the white water canoeing was more than spice. Uh, people did need, on the white, white water canoe trips, people did need white water canoe skills to be able to enjoy it. And so that was, that was a distinguishing factor and it made this uh, product very difficult for me to sell in Europe through the trade. And uh, so I'm going through the fourth wall here talking about business again. And um, um, you know, some, some uh, travel agent in Stuttgart who is selling um, your product for a wholesaler, who, you know, who's removed many steps from you to describe the difference to her people sitting in front of her in the office or him in the office and uh, and 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 question quiz them about their whitewater skills wasn't going to happen so um, it took me a long time to learn that um, this is um, on the Nahani um, on one of our um, conservation trips in the campaign to uh, expand the boundary of the Nahani to seven times its its boundary of the time to include the entire watershed. And that, that's uh, Jack Clayton and Olivia Chow who are uh, on that there. And um, this is a guy who you've uh, been hearing about lately. Um, Justin, uh, uh, the prime minister, who's also on one of those trips as uh, part of that uh, campaign. And and uh, and there he is again. And and um, I'm not. Uh, this isn't a social bragging session, um, but it's it's again going through the fourth wall, um, uh, having um, p influential people, especially in the political realm, um, was uh, in the in this roundabout way was very helpful for us in our our aim to be sustainable and to um, work towards. Um, what would now be called reconciliation um, because we were also in these campaigns working with the local First Nations people to achieve goals that they wanted to achieve. And um, we, what we brought to that um, table was um, the influence of these people and the influence of thousands of people who'd gone with us um, who would be advocates for, for the campaign. This is just another one of those. <laughs> But and then and then of course the other big attraction to all of these trips is it's the land of the midnight sun, and so which broke down stereotypes. And it was one of my challenges again through the fourth wall um, to help people understand that this isn't igloos and, and snowmobiles and stuff in the summer. That uh, it can actually be warm. In fact, it can be hot. Um, can be cool too. But uh, uh, you know, and, and swimming in the river can be at, at sometimes is, is highly desirable. 
Uh, and uh, it was very, uh, we, as time went along, we would try to, you know, keep, keep um, in touch with uh, 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 current uh, trends and the, the, some people doing Tai Chi on the beach. It was actually led by one of the guests, but um, we would also do stretching exercises every morning uh, when, when, when it seemed appropriate um, so that people would, um, you know, it was lifestyle things that would lead to healthy, healthy lifestyle. This is uh, also hot springs on the Nahanni. Um, they had, a, there was a lot of unique geological features and these are warmer than the hot springs we saw. This is Krauss Hot Springs and a lovely place to stop at the end of the canyons and recount uh, adventures from upriver. And uh, this is a book that I wrote about, but, uh, but the Nahanni. But um, I, I want I want you to f uh, focus on here is these large canoes. <clears throat> they're 28 feet long. These are uh, they're uh, rep replicas of the Voyager canoes that were paddled across Canada. The North canoes paddled across Canada by the fur brigades to transport furs and um, was one of the innovations. These things came apart in eight pieces to fit inside the Twin Otter. And um, it was something, and I'll tell you more about this story, but um, put this in your mind, what these look like, because um, I'm going, it's another part of the We're story. We're gonna come back to the canoe story because it's wild. <laughs> yes. It's uh, full of innovation, it's full of Failure. Yes, it, yes, yes. It stops and starts. Uh, Lots yes. of good stuff. So we yeah. will come back to that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, and the book, um, national bestseller, uh, second edition, didn't make me a penny. Um, <laughs> uh, again, through the fourth wall. Um, and it, uh, but in the time before the internet, it was a good promotional piece. And would it would it be now in the age of the internet? I don't know. But what I can tell you is, uh, and I'm going to jump ahead for. Uh, on this one, John, but uh, uh, I, I did engage with Amazon in, uh, I was a partner in Amazon in its early days, because uh, they were a bookseller. I don't know if you remember that, but this, mo <laughs> this monstrous thing that we now mostly love to hate uh, was a bookseller. That's how they got started. And they would sell books like mine. And I had a supply to sell. And uh, they, um, but uh, for, for very niche books like this, it really didn't work because I, I spent more money in the postage to send them the books to them than I ever, I ever got in the margin, the skinny margins that they paid. Um, but the, the, uh, the great thing that um, was the real payoff for me, and it's, uh, it's only in my heart, is that now when you go on and you search uh, Nahanni River Gold River of Dreams, eventually maybe on the fourth or fifth page, you'll find an Amazon listing for four hundred dollars. <laughs> Has anyone bought one? Uh, I I don't think so because I didn't get my share of that. <laughs> so now we're going to go to the Alsek and the Tachinshini. Um, spectacular rivers that begin just over there in our backyard and. Um, it, it's, I, I refer to this as floating through the world's largest shrinking non-polar ice cap. Um, and the, um, the, these rivers are, um, they, they rival the Nahanni for grandeur. Uh, Nahanni's may got a little more diversity for one watershed, but for grandeur, um, they rival Nahanni. And um, up until the late 80s, um, if I'd said to you, have you heard of the Tachinchini, you would probably would have said to me, yeah, I think I have. I think you can get it in four-wheel drive, and uh, <laughs> nobody knew about it. And um, but then there was um, it, it came out on the front cover of uh, a lead article in a magazine of the day called Equinox, uh, which you may remember in Canada, uh, which was a very um, trendy magazine that uh, eventually lived out its lifespan. But um, uh, that was uh, the cover of the Rolling Stone for Canadian adventure travel, and uh, and it took off. And when I realized after my first Nahanni trips that people were saying, my first season, people would say, that tr that was great. I, we had That was a fantastic trip. Where do we go next? And I realized I don't have a next. And so my next was the Tachinchini. And this is not the Tachinchini, nor is it the Alsec. This is the Grand Canyon. And the reason I put this in here is um, as a, a reference point for the Alsec. So we're gonna come down the Alsec River first. And um, the Grand Canyon, I don't need to tell you that it's the epicenter of 
white water and river travel it's where um, rafting as we know it now really uh, got its uh, feet and um, and the guides um, who people people dream for years of being guides in the Grand Canyon and they and when they once they are guides they stay there forever and they become gurus and and and, and, the, and the river gurus and they're worshipped by their their clients and, and rightly so and all the rest and uh, and but the the uh, when you're sitting around the campfire and you say to your your trip leader who's um, this well well uh, traveled uh, river guru and you say well where would you like to go next you know this has been my dream to go here where would and we all you know everybody here dreamed of the Grand Canyon where you're here all the time where would you like to go and they'll look up to the end rim of the canyon and they get a misty look in their eyes and they'll say there's this, this river up north called the Alsec. That's where I would like to go. So that's where they dream. It's in our backyard, the Alsec River, and it's, it's, uh, it's their dream. And this shows the largest biopreserve in the world, uh, Wrangell St. Elias National Park, uh, Kluani National Park, uh, now Tachinshini Provincial Park, and Glacier Bay National Park. Uh, and uh, the Alsec and Tachinchini flow through it. And this shows you the configuration. So the Alsec, can you see it coming down oops, into the Tachinchini? And they sort of form a wishbone. So Alsec um, comes down the, and the Tachinchini actually flows into it. And then, and then comes out, the, the water comes out on the Gulf of Alaska as the Alsec uh, at Dry Bay. And, and it's uh, a land of uh, like this. It's rugged and it's um, it's uh, ice, um, and the those rivers are a green corridor through there. And so that's the way that life moves back and forth from the coast to the interior, uh, including bipedal life like us. Um, and um, um, there's a uh, a lot of story, very cool stories about that. But in any event, uh, that's one of the key biologically important factors. And it's rich in First Nations heritage. The, uh, we have the Champagne Ajac people who tied into this country uh, in the Haines area and um, uh, Klingit on the coast and um, uh, very rich history. And they, they lived um, a, a very good life on the coast because it was very rich and easily harvested resources. And uh, there was a re very rich trade with the interior. Um, and um, anyhow, these are stories we would tell if you came on the river, um, but we're going to move on. Uh, so here, here we are on the Alsec River, and um, um, it has uh, glaciers um, as long as 110 kilometers. Uh, one of the glaciers covers 2,200 square kilometers. So massive glaciers, um, largest nonpolar ice cap, and um, in and uh, and Alsec has some some very good white water too. Uh, here we are on Lowell Lake. And under the midnight sun, our campsite on Low Lake, it's just, it's otherworldly. Um, no other way to describe it. And beautiful wild flowers adding color to this, this icy environment. Here we are again up on, uh, and this is called Goat Herd Mountain, overlooking Lowell Lake. And uh, great views of the glaciers and, uh, and goats, by the way. On, there's a resident herd on Goat Herd Mountain. Um, this is um, uh, Bobby Kennedy Jr. and his, two of his sons, and the one with the ball cap just over, just over the top of his hat is Mount Kennedy, named after his father, uh, after his uncle. Uh, but his father came here in 1965 to. Um, and climbed, 65 or 66, climbed that mountain at the uh, invitation of the Canadian government and uh, to name it after his uh, late uh, uh, brother. And, um, and then sadly, the next year he was assassinated. Um, but uh, so Bobby came up and um, did a trip with us on the Alsec and we flew him around Mount Kennedy and, and, um, and had a, um, a, a tremendous trip. 
Um, and uh, Jack and Olivia here again. And I guess one of the things that this uh, uh, slide uh, points to is the loyalty of our clientele. And that what we found over time was that once people had come with us once and if they felt they'd been well served, which I think 99.999% uh, of them did, um, they were, they adhered to us. And um, if they were going to do another river trip, which most of them uh, did, um, it would be with us. And so, and, and from a business point of view, Point of view, and we're again breaking from the fourth wall here. Um, the um, the cost of getting somebody to come with you for the first time is relatively high uh, because you'll talk to thousands of people to get a hundred to come. And um, but and you will talk. You will spend a lot of time with them. You might spend half an hour on average per person answering all their questions and stuff. And then most of them don't come. Um, these people who've been with you once. They will call up and say, uh, I see the July 4th ALSA trip. You got room? Yeah. Well, okay, book me for four. <laughs> Done. So um, that is um, th that really helped us. And that's why that having that next was so important. Having these 20 rivers was so important. And, um, and in times like COVID, it's so important because uh, right now, the, as you know, no secret, the tourism industry is in a crisis. It's made a sacrifice for the world uh, to uh, help the world uh, deal with COVID. And it was hit hardest and longest. And uh, But the, these returning guests are going to be, for the operators who are trying to survive this, are, are going to be uh, their salvation. And, and also, as uh, the other link to that returning guests is the guides. And uh, this is Trish Duncan, who is one of our many. We typically have 50 guides in a season, and um, most of them stayed with us for years and years and years. And uh, and like Trish, they were um, lovable, and um, the they they had far more influence over the guests and their decisions of where to go than I ever would, because uh, I'm seen as I'm the owner, and uh, I have ulterior motives. But the guides don't, and so people would ask the guides. Uh, during the trip, you know, where would you like to go next? Like that guy we asked in the Grand Canyon, and um, and uh, they would they would size them up because they wouldn't want to suggest a place where that they wouldn't be ready for or that they wouldn't enjoy, and um, and you know uh, basically softly pitch them on that next trip, and um, and that's how that, in a perfect world that's how that works. Fourth wall once again. Uh, so here we are coming into the canyons of the Alsec River, uh, a stupendous, the river races here. I call it a Himala Himala Himalayan like experience. Um, you're going down, crashing down through these rocky gorges with uh, massive glaciers. Uh, and um, this is the Tweedsmere Glacier, which in 2008, I believe it was, threatened to block off the entire river. And actually, the, the uh, coast of southeast Alaska, there were plans in place to evacuate everybody in case this did get blocked off because the block wouldn't last forever and when, if that released, it was going to cause a massive flood. As actually did once happen in 1875, the Alsec was blocked off at Lowell Lake by the, uh, the Lowell Glacier uh, for five years, built up a massive impound of water that released one day uh, in a flow greater than the equivalent of the Amazon, and uh, yeah, and obliterated uh, villages downstream, uh, which was which was unfortunate, a tragedy. But um, so just uh, that's in very recent history, something so dramatic like that, and um, um, th that uh, this this could have been the same thing. It was surging across, and oh, if you listen to Quirks and Quarks, you can probably uh, a week ago they were there was a guy who had set up cameras uh, two years ago to monitor this, couldn't get in to change them during COVID, and grizzlies had smashed down. <laughs> you, you heard about it, right? And um, so anyhow, you can listen to that. It's quite um, quite a great story. Um, so I, I mentioned, so the, here's our boomers now. And uh, this is Trish holding up a helicopter uh, above uh, the gear one, one, with one hand. Uh, so we, we would come to this place, uh, at, and this was the top of Turnback Canyon, which was unnavigable. And we'd use a helicopter to sling the gear over and then fly the people for uh, what would be the helicopter trip of a lifetime, just seeing uh, the massive glaciers. And, and we, we, we would talk it up and tell them how great it was going to be, but they would always say when they got out of the helicopter, I had no idea that was going to be so cool. 
Uh, so we've come down now to the Tachinchini, uh, where, uh, where the Tachinchini flows into the Alsac. This is a confluence, and again, midnight sun enjoying the, the water. So we'll take a look at the Tachinchini, um, and this it begins at a place called um, Shawashe. This is Neskarahin nearby, um, where uh, in the last century uh, it was the many, many hundreds, maybe thousands of people lived here at different times, and uh, but through um, pandemics, uh, their numbers uh, were decimated. And um, uh, then the gold rush happened. And uh, so it's called Dalton Post after a guy named Jack Dalton who took over the Greece uh, trails, which were the, uh, the native uh, uh, First Nations trails that they had developed for bring, to bring Ulican Greece from the coast, which was highly valued in the interior because because um, moose and, and other wild meat is, doesn't have fat, and so you uh, you'd really value uh, uh, the Ulican fish. And they're called candlefish. You can when they're dried, you can light them on fire like a candle. And um, in any event, he took over the trails and, and started, uh, made it into a toll road. Um, and, and this place is now called Dalton Post, but it's Shawashe is uh, the First Nations name. So we make our way down right now. Um, this is a, a movie we made, three minutes. And I said a picture's worth a thousand words, a uh, moving image is worth a lot more. So um, take it away, Rick. Where do I begin? There's so much. Every day, the river was a different river. Probably the uniqueness was the size that it started. We were almost uh, on a creek. It just got bigger and bigger and bigger as we went along. After every corner, there's just something new. Oh, the rapids were fun and added spice to the trip. You could feel the skill and confidence of the guides. You know, you're creating memories together, and, and also with the guides, I think they have been an incredible part of the journey. They bring so much more fullness and depth to what you're seeing around you. They clearly respected us all as individuals. They accepted us as we were with our strengths and weaknesses, and they helped tune our senses so we could enjoy the wildlife and highlights that we might have otherwise missed. It's great to have the, the 10 days because it really gives you a chance to bond with them, to get to know them, for them to get to know you. And then they just become part of the group and, and friends along the way. Just being able to pull up anywhere and camp. Life in the camp has been fun and, and a huge part of it as well as the experience of going down the river. We're basically drinking fresh, pristine water from the tributaries that are dumping into the Tachinchini in the Alsek. Coming out and being in the middle of nowhere with no one around is something that's truly special. It really gets you living in the moment. Feeling that on a daily basis is something that uh, hopefully I can bring back to the city with me and hold on to for a while. They made it so easy. The guides really showed us how to set up our camp. And then the meals they prepared every day, just incredible how they could carry that food and then prepare it as well as they did. The food that they put out was awesome and I think dinner time, drink time, that was probably the best part of the day where we all got together and uh, shared our experiences. Well, I love to hike and with the number of guides, we were always able to pick the pace and the goal that was right for us. No one ever felt like they were holding up others. You could feel relaxed and connect with this beautiful landscape you were in. The thing that's been amazing on this trip is that things just get better and better seeing some of the mountain ranges and just the vastness of them and how many peaks there were has been incredible. Some of the wildlife we've seen along the way. To have a tract of wilderness like this that is so, so pristine and protected, it gives you encouragement. It makes you feel like there can be corners like, like this in the world. This place here has just blown my mind. To see all the glaciers in the background and all the icebergs in the lake and even have a swim in the lake, incredible. You hear nothing and it's just this kind of quiet, serene moment. It's really special, it's really peaceful. You know, you can sit and just look at the bergs move and change for hours. To me, it's just life's about moments. 
And this is one of those moments that you will never forget. Um, it, it was raining when they were at Elsec um, uh, Lake, which is just before the end of the trip, and so I, I stuck this one in here so you could see uh, how cool it is when it's um, when it's sunny. And that's Mount Fairweather in the background, which w is the uh, tallest mountain in, in British Columbia, uh, poking out through there. And this is a, a bigger shot from the last campsite. It's, it's uh, words can't describe it. As you can see, it's it's incredible, and to, and the pictures don't even hold up to the when when you're really there. It's it's fantastic, and it's just in our backyard, just over there. So yeah, you catch caught in the um, in the slide in the uh, script uh, in sorry in the uh, what they were saying in the in the video that um, uh, talking about memories and um, uh, and stories, and I learned early on that. <clears throat> um, our participants on these trips were quite the same as the trophy hunters who go out after sheep and, and caribou and so forth. Uh, their trophy is the um, is the uh, the animal, but but for us, the, our participants and I, I think all, all of us, even the guides as well, our trophy was uh, the memories and the stories, because that's what you. That's what you, um, you you dine on and you uh, and you entertain on and you and you thrive on in your mind after you get home. And um, also, I learned. I also realized the importance of the of the um, dreaming and preparing part of the trip as well, getting ready. Um, and um, that's a big part. When you think about the next trip you're going on and think of the, the, or the last one you were on, think of the time you spent getting ready for it. And during it, that, all that, you know, collecting the things that you needed. Oh, I need to get another one of those, a special shopping expedition off to get that or whatever. And that's a, and that th those are f enjoyable parts of your day, unless, unless you're or, of your your year, unless you're you're rushed into it too much. But but um, anyhow, um, and maximizing again out behind the fourth wall, um, helping people to to enjoy that and bringing that into into the experience um, was, uh, and I'll talk about later with the with the internet was a very valuable thing. So lastly, we're, we're going to the Firth River. And um, here we are um, in the British mountains. It's in northern Yukon, right in, in our, uh, our uh, larger than life Yukon, supernatural, um, uh, magic and the mystery. Uh, uh, it's uh, on the right adjacent to Alaska up on the Arctic coast. So it starts in the British mountains, beautiful hiking, uh, stunning, and it has these tours, um, that these rocky outcrops that uh, tell us that this was not glaciated, glaciated in the last ice age, because all mountains have those, but where the glaciers have rubbed them off, uh, you don't see them, but here you do. Uh, like the, the mountain ridges look like stagosauruses with these tours. Uh, beautiful wildflowers. Uh, the tw you're north of the Arctic Circle, so you got more than you got 24 hours of daylight, and the uh, wildflowers just take off. And uh, the wildlife, uh, of course, the caribou, porcupine, caribou herd migrates through here. Um, wolves and all manner of of um, birds, Arctic tern, and. Um, it's just a, it's, a, it's stunning. Uh, if we're really lucky, we'll see the caribou crossing the river, um, and um, you know they're spread out. They take days to move through, uh, thousands of them. And and if we're lucky, we we come in contact. and and um, so we do a trip um, once a year with the um, Parks Canada staff who do um, water testing and so forth on the river, and we take them down the river and we invite guests on it as well. And so one of the things we do is we check all of the wildlife cameras that they have out and so this just I'll just show you a few of these because they're they're kind of kind of sometimes some of the animals look kind of goofy like they, they 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 didn't put their makeup on before the <laughs> photo shoot muskox so back to the rivers um, it's um, it's a, a, a fantastic float uh, some some really fun white water in the canyons so we come into these canyons and um, and doll sheep, the uh, most um, furthest north uh, doll sheep uh, population. And then we come out to the coast and um, 
the uh, and onto the Beaufort Sea. And this is, uh, and we see, we maybe see beluga, evidence of beluga whales, anyhow, and in the twin otter, that very expensive twin otter. Uh, and up there, it is super expensive. Uh, it, it's off the charts. Um, and uh, but just to, again, uh, behind the fourth uh, wall, um, the, to move a full group in and out, um, uh, close to $100,000. And um, the internet, um, just to, a reminder that when I started in, in 84, the internet wasn't even part of anybody, any of our dreams. We, you know, if you described, even in its simplest form with the, the old dial-up stuff, and you would have said, no, that's not possible. Um, uh, fax machines weren't even a, a, a thing back then for us. And so, anyway, I guess we're, we're back to the beginning. So, thank, Rick, thank you very much. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you for taking us on those trips. Yes, yes. Um, Neil, we met a few times before, before tonight, and um, what I was really grateful about the slides, besides being an absolute you know, visual delight, was putting on through the fourth wall um, you know, my business hat. I saw lots of things going right. I suspect there's a lot of things going oh, yeah. wrong. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure over time you learned a lot. So, so folks, what we're going to do now is, is we're kind of going to go through sort of three buckets. And the first sort of bucket I'd like to explore is, is a little bit more about you. Um, you know, why you do what you do, your origin story of sorts. Um, then I'd like to sort of shift into sort of some of the mechanics of the business. Um, and then I'd like to end, if it's okay, with um, where do you see opportunity looking forward? What would be your advice to today's and tomorrow's entrepreneurs? Does that work? That sounds great. Yeah. Okay. So let's maybe go. Let's, let's go. Let's <laughs> jump in. I, I guess um, one of my first questions is actually around the early years. And um, I, I don't want to sound half glass full, but I would love to, in those early years, Go through the fourth wall. Let's go through the yeah. fifth wall yeah. and and learn. You know, but, and I should say, I'm like I'm not from the arts community, so I don't know if fourth wall was the right reference. Was I going in the fifth wall? I don't even know what it means. I'm just owning it. Oh, okay, just, all right, okay. I've okay. never been there. It looks. You great. guys know what we mean, right? Okay. <laughs> okay. We're we're going. We're we're getting under the hood. You're with us. So in those early years, um, like what was it like? And I and I and again, I don't want to be glass half full, but. Tell, share some anecdotes of when things went sideways. Can you tell us about rejection? Oh. Like, tell us about like the what were the early years like? Yeah. Well, um, I started. Um, should I start where I started? Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I started, and I, I mentioned. I've already alluded to the fact that um, uh, I started under capitalized. Uh, Big John was the flip side of that. Um, but it was. Um, I had the chance to go to the Nahanni and. Um, uh, at, uh, I'd started a, a, I graduated from, I took outdoor education at university and I, no one, when I graduated, nobody was there with the perfect job on a silver platter for me. I, you know, it was shocking that that didn't happen. Um, so I, I, uh, I naively started my own company, you know, what, why not? And um, it was uh, an outdoor skills school, very simple, basically working out of my parents' garage. Uh, I called it Sunrise Wilderness Services and we, we taught, or I taught cross country skiing, canoe kayaking anything I could uh, to, to uh, pay for gas for my car and buy new socks and underwear and um uh, I had a chance I got to go to the Nahanni and um, while I was there I, I fell in love with it it truly was bigger and more grand than I had ever it was a dream it was a dream come true to go there and um, and while I was there, I, I, you know, because I had an interest in in uh, guiding and so forth and uh, instructing, uh, I I inquired about uh, what, uh, you know, who who can work here. And I found out that it was the licenses were all tightly regulated and they'd all been given out. Um, there was a chance that if you had permission of the local First Nations people, that you um, you might be able to to get one remaining license. And um, but so hold on, I just want to picture this. So you, you kind of just showed up. You had enough money for gas, underwear, socks. Yeah, yeah. You showed up and you're already asking, how do I get a license? 
Yeah, I, yeah. Okay, because so there's a bit of boldness here. Yeah, yes, and yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, reach for the stars. Okay. And um, uh, don't be afraid to dream. And and so anyhow, uh, I uh, I was so enthralled that summer that I came back a second time with friends in the fall because I didn't have a job. And um, in fact, nobody on the trip had a job either, uh, except for one guy who, who started, I think, at uh, 9 a.m. on September 18th. So that's when we had to be back uh, in, in Edmonton. And um, so anyhow, we, uh, th the thing that happened on that trip was that um, I, when I was, setting, I was driving the van to set up the shuttle at the place where we would finish on the Liard River, and I heard these screams of help from the river. It was early morning uh, on this frosty September morning, and I, I um, uh, ran down to the river to see what was what was going on. And I, I'll never forget what I saw it was this this uh, image of a there was a man and a woman and a little girl in this aluminum boat and they'd clearly been drifting all night and something was broken down with the motor because they, they didn't have uh, any means they didn't have paddles, they didn't have life jackets uh, uh, none of that and, um, and they knew that uh, oh, and draped across the front of the boat was a refrigerator and, and yeah and um, they knew that further th after this point uh, they were unlikely to be able to, to uh, there was nobody else uh, that they could contact to help them and there was the Beaver Dam Rapids which is a fault line right across the river and it, they would have perished there and they knew that and um, so um, I, I looked around and I saw a, a canoe and there was a tent, a little pup tent beside the canoe and I yelled at the tent and there was a, a guy came out and I said, we've got to help these people, they're, they're uh, um, drifting out of control down there. And so we, we paddled out there and the one thing they did have was they had this massive rope, like a hawser from a uh, battleship it seemed. And we, we took that and we tied it around uh, the thwart and we paddled our guts out for what felt like hours. I'm sure it wasn't. We, but it took, took us two kilometers uh, to get down river to, before we got them in. And um, they were, you know, uh, becoming hypothermic. The fellow had jumped in the water during the night to try to pull, swim the boat into shore and failed at that. And they were in bad shape, but, uh, but they were safe now. And uh, they said, if there's ever anything we can do for you, let us know. And I said, look, just get home safe. That's what, you know, I, that's what you can do for me. And uh, we parted ways. And uh, I went uh, on my second trip down the river and then went home with uh, the thought that I would write to the, the good people of the village of Nahanni Butte, which is 100 people, very remote place, no roads, one phone, a radio telephone in those days. And, um, and so I, I wrote to, to the government guys that told me to write to the Hunters and Trappers Association and explain what you want to do and you know you want permission. And, and um, I didn't get any responses to my letters. I'd go to the mailbox every day, you know, in anticipation, no, nothing there. Then in January, I remembered, I, yeah, I have these new friends in the North uh, from that experience. Um, I should talk to them and they live in the Hanny Butte. So um, that one radio telephone, four things had to happen for it to work. Um, it had to be working. Um, it was in the general store in town. Um, you had to hope someone would answer it, that that person would want to go and get the person that you wanted to talk to, and that that, that person would want to come and talk to you. And none of those things were a sure thing. Um, and But I, I beat the odds, and I got all four, and this fellow came to the phone, and he remembered me. and. Um, he says, yeah, I, uh, he says, I, I'd love to help you. I can tell you, first of all, what you're doing will never work. He said, if you don't come and meet these people face to face, forget it, it's not gonna work. Um, and he said, if you do come, um, I promise, what I can promise you is that I will introduce you to the people who you should meet and I can put in a good word for you, but I can't promise you anything more than that. But what you're doing, the way you're doing right now, forget it, it's not gonna work. So I spent my last nickel, literally, and uh, with and a, with a friend. His dad um, owned a plane. We we uh, I bought the gas. We uh, flew up there, and um, actually I don't think I did buy the gas, but I I, I did spend my last nickel. Uh, we flew up there, and uh, and this fellow was true to his word, and he took me around and uh, and introduced me to the community, and we had uh, some good talks and. I left with a letter of permission. And um, that was a turning point, significant turning point in my life, like huge. 
and um, uh, so so um, I left and um, and that's that's kind of how all this started and would not have started without that and the neat thing is that years later um, we did many things in partnership together as a, the community and and the company we uh, uh, hired local people for interpretive programs when when that was when they were available and um, uh, and, and other things, um, but uh, the, the really neat thing was that when they wanted to protect the entire watershed as part of their protected lands, um, they were able to use what I brought to the table, and which would have been pointless without what they brought to the table, And but the two together um, was effective. Um, so there's a lot in that story. I mean, what I, one of the things that we've talked about was relationships. Um, but I do want to go back to rejection. Mm -hmm. Now, the story ended out well, but you did tell us that you went every day to that mailbox. You took yeah. an empty mailbox. And I have to believe, not just in that story, but in other stories, you got a lot of rejection I did. from yeah. clients, yeah. from potential investors. And so in those moments when you yet again got rejected, what kept you going? Yeah. Well, yeah. So just to, I can quantify the rejection. Uh, the, 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 the day to day rejection was um, probably 90 percent because uh, about 90 percent of the people who would contact us to find out about, you know, what it is we have to offer and so forth would never come in the end. So that that's rejection. You know, uh, you get you spend all this time with people and you have great talks with them and they get you excited because you think, oh, finally, we've got a booking here for this trip. And uh, then and then usually you'd never hear from them. But if you do follow up, you just find out, yeah, no, we decided not to so that's rejection that that um, but um, but particularly in the yeah. early years yeah it, yeah yeah what kept you going yeah it must have been tough oh yeah well you know it was um, it was uh, the the activity uh, the, the combination of the dream and and just enough uh, um, enough success like the success of meeting with the people and getting that letter um, the success of um, of cobbling together uh, with the help of family um, the resources to uh, to get a, a very modest start at it um, that and the dream um, I think fueled and 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 dreaming and, and formulating in the same way that our guests formulate in their mind ahead of the trip they make a movie in their minds of what this trip's going to be like and that I think kept me going and you know it wasn't like a promise of riches like I wasn't it wasn't like I thought I'd invented the the, the better mousetrap and I was going to be fabulously wealthy none of that um, it was more I, I guess um, of course I thought I hoped I would have a sustainable business and sustainable livelihood from it um, but it was the doing something that I, I wouldn't even have dared have dreamed of previous to, to all those things happening um, and, um, and wanting to to uh, to do that and grow it and nurture it and kind of like you know uh, growing a garden I guess uh, that same sort of, of uh, planting those seeds and uh, hoping they'll grow into something great. I want to, I want, remember folks, we talked about the big canoes, well, we're going to talk about the big canoes, but just to weave it in, you know, when I, when I hear your, what you just shared is you must have incredible grit, incredible determination. You get knocked down a lot <laughs> and you keep popping up. And I want to weave in, uh, we sh you talked about this story um, about these canoes and of course not my story, I want yep, you to tell yep. it, but I want you to really tell us about what you were chasing and why, and then why it ultimately failed and what you learned. Yeah, well, yeah, um, yeah, I, I guess I was, uh, so um, I had part of the dream was, um, I loved, I loved the canoe. I loved it passionately, so much so that um, I had quite a disdain for rafting and rafters. Uh, in fact, I would tell rude jokes about uh, rafters. This is very fourth wall, or maybe sixth, <laughs> sixth wall. wall yeah. Folks. Yeah. Um, I'm silent. I, I, I did, and uh, until I realized finally later on that there was there was definitely places that where rafts could take us that canoes never could that were really worth seeing. And so um, I had I had this this great idea that um, if I could make these large uh, replicas of the Voyager canoes, so that there'd be a guy one guide in. In the boat kind of like a raft except that it was a lot more um, graceful looking 
and uh, you know had the sinuous lines and the heritage of the canoe, uh, the aesthetics of the canoe. That it would be a way that people who who couldn't uh, didn't have the whitewater skills to paddle a small tandem canoe that they could come to the Nahanni and experience it in a canoe, not in a rubber bus. Uh, those were my words at the time, uh, and and because uh, that's how I I, I saw it because I I hadn't been I hadn't been brought into raft culture at the time, and um, so I uh, I thought this is a this is a fantastic idea. So I had lots of enthusiasm, um, and I had um, um, no research, and so so did you um, ask anyone about this, disaster. or you just did it? Like, you know, did you ask clients like, "Hey, would you think of this?" No, or you just no. you did it. I, I just I just okay. did because I knew better. I okay, knew better. You, you were Henry Ford. Well, yeah. <laughs> we don't need another horse and buggy. We're yeah. getting the model T. Exactly. Okay, so this yeah. is your model T moment. Yeah, worked out better for Henry. Uh, so so I um, I first I made these cedar strip and fiberglass ones. I spent a winter making them these, these prototypes, and they were beautiful. I don't know if you you've seen cedar strip and fiberglass. It's gorgeous, but um, uh, and and then sawed them up into pieces and made them so they. They could nest together to go inside the twin otter, and um, and that was that's, right, that's a crucial point. You have to collapse them. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah it's the only way to so get. You're not just building there. big boats. No. You're you're like building collapsible big boats. Yes, that's right. So it was it was yeah. This was this was different. As I built my first canoe when I was 14 in high school shop, and that's kind of how I got the canoe thing got into my brain, and um, that was a big part of it. And, so um, I, I built, yeah. So I built. It was an, in, in, it was truly an innovation. Uh, these these uh, sectional Voyager canoes, and um, so we we for a few years we ran a number of trips with them. But I began to realize that most people didn't understand the big canoe. They they really either wanted to go in a canoe or they wanted to go in a raft, one or the other. And the big canoe thing, the advantage of it that I thought was so, such an advantage meant nothing to them. And I realized also that it would take a lot of education to help people see that, and I did not have the gazillions it would cost to do that, and, and it probably wasn't worth doing. So that was failure. And to realize after all that work, because it was a lot of work, because what we did was we made those prototypes out of cedar strip and fiberglass, used them for a couple of years, and then one of my uh, clients who was with the uh, uh, in the oil industry, he um, he just said you could be roto molding these out of plastic, and I thought that sounded very technical and uh, difficult. And he said, come to my our lab and we'll show you. So I, he took me to their lab, their skunk works. Uh, where where they experiment with all kinds of stuff, and I saw roto molding actually was kind of a cowboy thing. It was pretty simple, um, and uh, but not cheap. And so I had these steel molds made of all these pieces, and then we started roto molding out of plastic. So I was investing a lot into this, uh, uh, physically, financially, and emotionally, and it was flat. And was and, there a moment where you're like, this is not the Model T? You know, you know, uh, it was probably a number of moments where I slowly uh, came to the realization. I think, I think it took a while, and uh, from a number of different directions, I realized, huh, another, you know, just here's another reason why this isn't going to succeed. Another and another and another. So many rejections or negative experiences on that front, and and. Um, but the but the the interesting thing was so it it really drifted away from the Nahanni, and uh, all of a sudden in the meantime I had learned about rafts the value of rafts on the Tatshenshini which was our next river and and other places and then I started to acquire companies because that was a way to grow the company and I needed and you mentioned you know I said I needed a next and so I acquired companies to have a next uh, because most of these rivers had permits and to get the permits at that point in time you had to. Uh, by another comp by the company that had the permits, and um, and so so I had I had um, wrestled in my conscience and and fell in love with rafts as well or made a place for them in my heart, and uh, and and so I kind of you know quietly drifted away from the the, the Voyager canoe. However, at the same time, uh, with a, a friend of mine, we started a company in Jasper on the Athabasca River using the large Voyager canoes called Rocky Mountain Voyageurs, and he was the managing partner. I, I was living up in the north at the time uh, we were doing this, and um, he would manage it. And um, 
And that too, in the beginning, was failed. Um, we, we thought this is like there was Americans and Japanese who were pouring into Jasper. So this is a different market than here? Yes. Same product, different Two hour market. float trips, so very yeah. different. Okay. But we, again, quickly learned, we, we, again, we thought the Voyager canoe would be so attractive to them. And, um, but uh, we learned that they either wanted to raft or they wanted to shop, one or the other. And this, there was no room in their minds for this. You, you, the minute you use the word canoe, even if it was Voyager, canoe, they heard canoe, that's the tippy boat. Uh-uh, rafting. We're going rafting or we're going shopping. And uh, But one after a couple of years, and, and we used to joke that the, 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 the Athabasca River, which was kind of green, was getting greener because of all the money we were dumping into it with this, you know, failed efforts. However, uh, finally, we had this uh, woman come one day who um, she uh, quite enjoyed it, and she had a British accent, and she was at, she was with a British tour group, and she was they were just starting to come to Jasper, and uh, she said, you know, I think our people would really like this, and the difference was. They understood the Voyager canoe because of the heritage from you know the, the Hudson's Bay Company and all that stuff. They knew about it, uh, and also they, a, a side benefit was they were much more hale and hearty than the Americans and the Japanese, who would not show up if there was a cloud in the sky. But these people would anything that happened in Jasper weather-wise was better than back home in, in England. So it was bonus, win-win all around. Anyhow, um, the next season we had five thousand people, uh, wow. and, and, so and there's, there's a Lot, there's a lot in this story where you tried something in a context A. With no research. With no research. And surprise, it failed. Um, but it worked in a different market. And you didn't have to do this. You chose yeah. to do this. And I guess what I want to drive at is, you know, you've been in business for a while. You've been part of a few companies. You've tried a bunch of things. You decided to innovate. Whether at the moment you built the canoes you saw as innovation or not, why is it important as a business owner to continually experiment, even if you know your chance of success are low? Why yeah. is it important to innovate? Well, back then, um, and it's a good question, because back then, um, you know, the company was still in its infancy, and I was still grossly mismanaging it. Uh, not, not because I went to the very expensive business school of hard knocks, self-inflicted. And uh, so you really I, you started this when you really couldn't afford to do it, but you did it anyway. I couldn't afford to do it, and I really didn't have the business training and the okay. business knowledge. Okay. And um, so I was I was having to learn fast as I as I went along. And um, and if you want to talk about rejection and failure, um, you know, I I I. I, I, I when I first started, I, I didn't really understand the role of simple things like a bookkeeper, and uh, you know, I, I I just didn't understand the scope of of uh, the responsibilities involved with business. And um, I, I had an entrepreneurial bent. I just didn't have and leaning, but I didn't have the the the, the uh, training. And um, so I was having to pick that up along the way. So so it wasn't um, the northern stuff wasn't flourishing. It was doing okay, it was bubbling along and slowly growing. And so I was looking for ways to enhance the, the company and to um, you know, think, you know, try to find that, that thing that would take off and, and um, make it more viable and sustainable. And um, um, so that started to happen as I started to acquire these other businesses. And, um, uh, and, and one of the things I, I got when I bought these companies is I got more knowledge because I, I would learn from the guy I was buying from uh, his uh, lessons and secrets and so forth and from the staff who came along with those companies I would learn their best practices and some of them were real upgrades to what we were doing. So, so that's interesting in that moment of acquisition in some cases you actually got more than just the company. Mm -hmm. you, did you recognize that at the time or is that something that you yeah. would you would advise yeah. to future people like that's the benefit of acquisition. Yeah, I th I think it, it's really important to don't assume that that's going to come. Sure. And, and you you probably want to know, make sure in your negotiations that it's going to be set up in a way that you um, will have access to that uh, all those opportunities to learn. Um, but um, I, I I guess I I lucked out, and um, so I I learned a lot from not only the owner but from their staff, some of their staff. Um, and um, uh, and they, so they were real bump ups each time. And um, back to the canoe, just to take that story where, again, classics, somebody else takes what isn't working for one person and makes a huge success out of it. Um, 
uh, my buddy uh, Bart Henderson from um, Haines, Alaska, who um, Bart is a tremendous guy, very modest. He wouldn't tell you these things unless you asked him. He introduced rafts to New Zealand. Think, think about that. And he also introduced rafting to the cruise industry. He's the first one in the world to introduce rafting to the cruise industry. Think about that. So, um, he, and he did that long, he, he did that in the early 80s before I even started. So, by the time Bart and I got to know each other, um, he, he had been, Bart had done very, very well for himself. And um, he, asked, he asked me one day if, um, about these big boats I had, and, um, and, and he was curious about it, I told him, and he said, he said, can I buy some from you? Sure, yeah, I guess. And, and my experiences hadn't been great from a business point of view, so I thought, well, whatever, uh, it's a chance to sell some boats. And uh, how many would you like? Uh, 10, how about 10? Okay, and um, Bart had bought this um, piece of land up the fjord at the Davidson Glacier, uh, up the fjord from Haines. No road access, and, and the glacier came down to his little piece of land and, uh, that he bought from a widow in Kentucky who had inherited it. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, the glacier came down to, and, and the calved icebergs into this little lake at the toe of it. And, um, and I thought, Bart, you know, like, have you lost your mind? Like, why do you buy that? Uh, there's no roads there. So anyhow, he took my canoes, he uh, flew people from the cruise ships, and he was already had a pipeline with the cruise ships. He was doing thousands and thousands and thousands of people a year uh, in his raft float through the Eagle Preserve and other things, and he flew them from Skagway to Glacier Point, where this, I think what she named, or whatever, he, to that spot, and then took them, um, put a, a little um, four-horse motor on the, each canoe and putt-putted around the glaciers. Uh, first year, I think he did 10,000 people. Okay. Yeah, so Bart was the one who made the money off those canoes and, and continued to to this day. Uh, he, sold, he finally sold that company. He's, he's, re, he's sort of retired now. Um, but um, so there's an example of a, you know, and we hear like Alexander Graham Bell invented the phone so to help deaf people hear. Right. It was right. a talking device. Uh, yeah. He did, it was never anticipated, you know, the phone we own today. And this is not as, obvious, not as grand a scale as that, but uh, similar type of taking something that's not working in one application and making it flourish in another. Well, it's so interesting in two you were involved with and one you weren't. I want to switch gears and I, and I want to ask maybe a tough question. And it, again, when we look at the, the slideshow, we see amazing landscapes, we see smiling people. We also, for people who think about logistics, we're seeing airplanes, we're seeing boats, we're seeing water, we're seeing risk. In your in your career to date, what, as a business owner, was the hardest decision you ever had to make? Um, probably, um, probably the hardest decision, interestingly, that I had to make, and, and I'll say this in the background, that we had many dramatic disasters, okay. um, including a fatality and including many um, you know, injuries and evacuations and so forth, which I can talk, I'll talk about more later. But, um, Probably one of the hardest decisions was actually um, about 20 years ago after after uh, the um, maybe uh, after the high tech stock market crash um, and 9/11, uh, which we, I went through a series of of crisis, financial crisis, world financial crises over the years. At least six of them, starting with Black Monday in '87, and then the ni early '90s. Um, uh, recession, then the high-tech stock crash, then SARS 9-11, and then finally the 2007-2009 uh, financial crisis. And, um, and all of them were brutal. Uh, brutal to tourism because um, tourism is the easiest luxury to drop. And, and can I jump in? One yeah. thing, I, 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 you told me that what was really important to you, we talked about relationships earlier, yep. is you always paid your staff. So even yes. in those tough yeah. times, you were the last guy to get paid, if at all. Yeah, if so at all. That's part of the context. So I yeah. guess, like in these crises, you might have been in the red. Yes, that's right, and that's and 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 thank you for the segue because that's what was happening. A number of those in those crises, I lost money, and um, you know, being a small company, um, you know, the buck stops with you, and um, 
and uh, the, the savings were depleted and I'd have to borrow um, and to, to pay everybody. And then, and then it would take a number of good years just to pay back the debt before, you know, even if they're real good years, you still didn't make money. And, um, and, and so the hardest uh, decision, one of, one of the hardest decisions I made was to decide to increase my prices because I realized at one of these junctures that, and I think this was about 20 years ago, that um, we were not making money. And I, you know, I, I, I knew what we, uh, to, to, de to deliver the product that our clientele wanted, the baby boomers who we weren't going to, the baby boomers, were the, well, that was our market, uh, mostly from southern Canada, actually from, uh, from the uh, Toronto, lower, southern Ontario area. Um, and I knew what they wanted, and I knew how we had, what we had to deliver, and we weren't charging enough to do that. But and, you, and earlier on, you said that it was really important to get return clients. Yes. So I imagine, surprise to return client, we'd love to have you back, but we've just increased the price. Well, exactly, back. yeah. So I, w I figured um, I had to dramatically raise the prices if we were gonna continue and be sustainable and, and survive. And I, I figured if I did that, it was gonna be business suicide, because I figured people, when people see our prices jump up 10% in one year, um, or uh, um, they're, they're gonna, um, you know, they'll just back off. But you didn't have a choice. I had, well, I, I, you know, I didn't really have a choice. I mean, I could have continued to go this way. And um, so I, I bit the bullet and I did it and I figured this is probably my exit from this wow. career because, you know, who's going to, um, who's going to uh, come and pay that? And, um, and, and, and just, you know, the sticker shock of seeing the price go up and all that stuff. And, um, uh, much to my happy surprise, um, business was the best I'd ever had the next year, and and continued to do that, and um, uh, and I realized I probably hadn't increased it enough actually, and um, realized that the ceiling was far far higher than I thought, and because I realized that what it, see when I first started out with the baby boomers. Um, I was just out of university, they were just out of university, none of us had much money. What The kind of travel we were used to doing was low budget, you know, the cheapest, the cheapest, the cheapest, the cheapest, what's the cheapest trip, I'll take that one, uh, what, you know, what's the cheapest gear, I'll take that one. And um, But that had all changed, because now they had money, and now they what they really wanted was quality and reliability. And uh, and they wanted that trip of a lifetime, and they wanted it, uh, you know, with the, all of the parameters that, um, that were you know we had defined, and so um, they were willing to pay more for that, and and I realized uh, you know in um, in the end that the, um, their abilities to pay more for holidays had had uh, gone up a lot more than I had realized, and they were going to Antarctica, for example, for paying many 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 times what what they were charging for us, but but our trips they valued as much as that. So that was a real lesson for me, and it's it's a lesson that I think um, you know throughout uh, the tourism industry and pan industries. It's a lesson for entrepreneurs is to to um, not uh, to to do your best to figure out ways to build value into your products so that you can charge more. Um, you're still giving a worthwhile product, but uh, probably getting a better margin than a rock bottom price product. And it's more sustainable. It means you can pay your staff more. You can um, do more good in the community. You can re refresh your equipment more regularly. Um, you can do more, uh, you know, have the luxury of doing more educational stuff with you, for your people and, and, and more staff training, just all those things that, you know, the perfect world for what we'd all like our businesses to be. You can't do that if you're not, uh, if your margins aren't there. And, um, so that was a huge lesson for me, but it was a super hard decision to to do. Uh, it paid off in the end, but man, I I sweated with that one um, for a long time. You know what I appreciate with that is um, you you hear this, you hear people tell stories of that. You know, um, we heard one before we started today about someone too busy. Well, if I double my price, maybe I'll have my clientele, and the opposite happens. So we know rationally that this can happen, but in that moment, it must have been really scary. You must have felt like this could be the death knell. Oh yeah, well, I, I true. I, I think I, if you at the time, um, you know, if, if if you and I had had a quiet conversation about it as I was doing, I I, pro I would have said to you, yeah, I you know, I need to be looking for a job now because this 
this really isn't going to work out well. It's not going to end well. So let me let me go there, and I promise we won't just get into the, the hard yep. stuff. But I think this is important part of the real story. Mm-hmm. So you described um, one of your more difficult situations. I want to ask. You mentioned fatality. You you've shared stories of planes going awry, like lots of chaos, lots of crisis. In those moments. What has been your North Star? What have you grabbed onto to sort of help guide what Neil's going to do next? Well, I guess um, having, um, no, you know, having sorted out in my mind um, what my bigger picture goals were, that um, so when things did go south or when we were challenged, um, I, I wanted the uh, best outcome of whatever solutions we would pick to to solve the problem of the day um, to make things the best for everybody involved and that doesn't necessarily mean that they were everybody would be happy but that it, w- the solution would be fair and reasonable and um, sometimes I probably uh, you know I could have been harder nosed and uh, and sometimes it probably should have been harder nosed but um, um, that was my, um, I'd say my North Star was to be fair, to be, um, uh, to look for the best uh, outcome for all involved. And whether that was, you know, dealing with something very dramatic like a, you know, an injury that, well, some simple decisions that some, you know, or some s- simple factors that can, can be uh, like around, for example, evacuating somebody, it can cost tens of thousands of dollars to evacuate somebody and we did have some times when we if somebody could hold on for another day it would be a fraction of the cost to extract them and 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 this especially in the days before travel insurance was as popular and stuff like that um that, that periodically we would come up against that and um, um but uh, i my go-to would be to do the right thing which would be you know if that was me or, or one of my family i'd want them out now and um so bit the bullet and we um we you know one time a woman broke her her femur at the base of virginia falls and she'd been out kind of wandering around by herself while we were portaging and nobody saw her go down nobody knew she was where she was she was behind a rock slippery rock in the midst of the falls and uh, it took three hours to find her and uh, in the meantime her femur had been broken for all that time and long story short we uh, got got her out in a um, a helicopter this is before satellite phones and all the rest so it was a lucky fluke that we found a plane just at the um, top of the falls that we could send a message out with so he he once he got up high he radioed and they got sent a helicopter in and uh, they sent a learjet to fort simpson where they transferred her she was on the operating table in the, in the university hospital in edmonton by midnight and um, but and this was 30 years 30 years ago, it cost that that all episode cost thirty thousand dollars to to get her down there. She was happily and coincidentally, she was our first guest who'd ever brought bought trip insurance. And, and thank goodness. And in fact, it was such good insurance in those days. She's one of the few people who'd actually driven to Handy, to Fort Simpson, and her car now was marooned in Fort Simpson. And the insurance company paid to put her tr- her car in a truck and truck it back. To, blah blah blah. It was win win win. But uh, you know that you know those were choices that um, we had to make. And we uh, in those days when we, and we when we weren't pushing the the insurance uh, the way we do now. Um, the, could have been, you know, we. It, my it was my credit card that went on uh, those flights. So um, yeah. I could see how that would be. Do you want to be human? You want to be the best you can. You also have a business to run. That might have must have been hard. So mm-hmm. yeah. um, I, I want to. We want to have some time for a couple questions from the audience and from folks joining us remotely. Um, but before we go there, I want to explore a little bit from your chair what you see in the future. And you know, one of the reasons you construct host these is to support entrepreneurs, business people. You are very much embedded in the tourism sector, and we are in a crisis. Um, and yet, there must be opportunity. And so, when you, whether it's in the Yukon, whether it's in wilderness adventure tourism, whether it's broadly speaking, 
if you were able to share what you see as opportunity to entrepreneurs today who want to jump into tourism, what's the opportunity? What's the opportunity right now being presented to us in tourism? Yeah, well, I think that um, you know crises often brings about opportunity, and um, there's there was a tremendous opportunity brewing before COVID, and that is that right now we're seeing the largest retirement and. Um, and resignation. Uh, Tracy and I were just at a, a meeting where she had this great uh, term, uh, retirement and, and resignation and society of the, and it's the boomers, um, like me, um, moving on and leaving these openings. And, and um, so in many ways, this leaves a great opportunity for, um, for, for young entrepreneurs. Uh, I mean across the board as service providers, as customers, like the whole thing. The whole, the whole package, yeah. And, um, but particularly, so if you are uh, entrepreneurially oriented, excuse me, there's opportunities to either um, find a, an area that was being served by what's now a dying company uh, or, or a company that's disappeared and, um, and step in and provide that, uh, or to uh, acquire a company from somebody who wants to get out and um, get their, 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 uh, their permits, their assets, their, um, their wisdom, and their market, their their list, and um, and, and uh, you know carry on, um, and probably breathe new life into it. Kind of like buying that house that you renovate, and then you know, and but in this case, probably maybe not flip, just keep it and run it, um, or um, some will do you know uh, build it up and flip it, um, and um, also uh, the other thing I would guess I would recommend is. Um, for, for young entrepreneurs, it's a real good idea to start to, if you're interested in, in tourism as an entrepreneur or, or whatever you're interested in, um, don't be afraid to get a job in that area first. Because then you can see it as an insider and uh, you know, do your, some research and investigation mm. from the inside of the, of the beast. And, um, and, uh, and, and it'll alert you to connections that might lead you to good opportunities. And, um, and you'll pick up some education, some skills. I would have been well served to do that in my case. Uh, it's probably one of my bigger regrets that I, I didn't do. But, but let me connect something, and I wrote this down on purpose when we were talking earlier. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to weave in starting a business in the Yukon. And what I wrote down is you felt people should ask, am I willing to fail? Mm -hmm. Can you tell me more yeah. about that? Yeah, um, you, you need to be willing to fail. And um, you know, I, I, I've alluded in my story, I had a number of times near that precipice and I had things that failed, projects that failed. And um, yeah, if you're gonna undertake um, a business, um, you have to be ready to, uh, to fail. You have to, have, you're, you have to be well enough capitalized and you have to be willing to lose that capital um, because the, the track record's not good. You know, um, uh, the majority of businesses uh, fail or you know wither into something else, um, and it's the minority that actually take off and thrive. And so, um, you know, why are you going to beat those odds? What's so good about your idea that you know? And so, uh, you have, a, have to have a lot of confidence in that idea, and it, be, it has to be well researched and all those things. But you you need to go into it from you know. I'd, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't say you you have to be comfortable that if you if you lose everything that you're putting into this can you can you be good with yourself after that you know what, uh, will that destroy you or um, uh, or your family you know and um, but I, I had tremendous support from my family uh, my my sisters uh, uh, my my mom and my dad they all helped um, and my uh, later my family when I was married from uh, I remember my stepson um, uh, uh, stamping envelopes and uh, you know all these things but um, the company has to be able to be, get up on its own feet eventually because that's not sustainable and um, you know bless their hearts that, that's a, a great uh, contribution to have I, I was forever grateful for that but um, it um, you, you need to uh, uh, the company has to be able to get up on its own feet right okay. On its own. okay um I have two more questions and then we're gonna open up to any questions in the audience as well as if you're joining us on zoom um, but my second last question is whether it's from the lens of tourism or just entrepreneurship more broadly, when you look into your crystal ball, what is not changing and what is quickly changing? 
And maybe I'll flag the one thing that um, that I, I heard you say yeah, when we sure. talked earlier is that you know personal connection is more relevant today in our digital age than ever. Yeah. So tell, tell me tell me about that. Yeah. Well, uh, a, a good anecdote on that is um, I was at a conference years ago where um, uh, the, the guest um, speaker w um, was um, the the founder of. Um, uh, Butterfield and Robinson, Robinson, which is a cycle touring company that exploded in France and is a super successful Canadian company. And someone asked him, asked the, the founder what his secret uh, to success was. And, and uh, he said, very simple, the little yellow stickies um, and that you stick on you know, documents, and, those, and this was when the yellow stickies were fairly new actually, uh, that um, we, we would stick one on every, it was uh, our, the, um, the, like a post the office. Like a post-it note, you mean? Yeah, post-it note, yeah. Okay. The, the office manager who, who um, you know, spoke with these people on the phone would, would write um, uh, with, in hand, you know, in ink, um, uh, here you go, uh, Sue and Bob, um, I know you'll love this, Cindy, or whatever, you know, and it was, it was genuine. It. Simple. Yeah. Yeah, simple, but it took it from being impersonal to being wow. That's we know Cindy now. Like we we have a connection, and she went out of her way to write that. And um, his point was um, that. It's and, and they did it in many more ways, but it was that personal contact and that treating your your guests as. Um, in the beginning in a way that would invite them to be friends and in the end as friends and um, and that is in spades going to be more uh, you know more and more important uh, and um, especially in this digital age where everything's becoming more impersonal and more uh, well uh, everything we know about um, that personal contact will be incredibly important okay Okay. What was the other thing? The other part was, I appreciate that's a change, but to me that's something that carries through. Let's flip it, and, and what is absolutely changing? Yeah. That as an entrepreneur, whether you're tourism or otherwise, you've got to pay attention to. Yeah. Well, a big one in the Yukon is reconciliation. Okay. And um, I think, you know, when... When I, 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 I treated the people in Nahanni Butte and in the other places where I operated um, as partners because uh, I was on their land. And um, th they, uh, that, that, uh, but, and I, and I, that was my, how I, and that's why I was happy to help. I was happy to help out with the, um, um, in the Peel watershed with what I call the seven sacred rivers area um, and, and helping them get uh, their uh, land planning uh, done fairly. And so the, uh, but I, it's, that is changing and is super important because uh, it's going to come with um, much more dynam dynamism uh, around that, that those and you have to know if you're a person who wants who can work with a partner mm. because partnerships are are can be tough I mean they have many benefits in business but they can be very tough and there's a lot of people who are just better off working on their own and it, and you need to know that about yourself and if you are that person um, you you bet maybe should look at operating actually you know outside of those areas where where you would be in partnership with the First Nations group um, because um, uh, any partnership can be challenging and um, when you're dealing with a, a group of uh, with a community um, that's a lot of partners to have and to keep happy and to keep communicating with and all that stuff um, so that's some soul searching that. Um, in tourism, uh, wilderness tourism uh, in particular, uh, in the Yukon, young on, new entrepreneurs are going to have to seriously ask themselves and, and uh, survey uh, uh, consider. Okay. My last question, and stripping away, uh, you know, so much. If an entrepreneur came to you and said, "Neil, I'm starting something," what's your best advice? I'm at the early stages of this thing. What do I need to know? Can you boil it all down? Yeah, to, um, uh, research, research, research. Uh, put it through the, the you know the, 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 the fires of of um, of the of the uh, 
the fire thing that the anvil and the, Brander. Uh, brand, uh, no. uh, I think everybody knows what we're talking about. Uh, and, and the crucible, uh, I guess. And um, um, so, so research test um, and and. Um, and ask of people who, don't ask the people who are going to tell you what you want to hear. Um, I think it was Bill Clinton who said that uh, the hardest thing in his day, every day, was for him to find someone who wouldn't tell him just what they thought he wanted to hear. Wow. Uh, and um, similarly, and you know, if you ask your friends, uh, they may be too supportive. You want to ask the friends who are going to be hard on you and, and make you um, think things through hard. Um, and um, I, it was stat with hiring, I always looked for attitude, aptitude, and ability in that order. And I'd say, you know, for for entrepreneurs, attitude was first. A attitude is first. Okay. Yeah, you can't you can't train attitude and and. Um, and if you, and if you don't have kind of an adventurous uh, entrepreneur. Uh, leaning that's it's willing to be to take on significant risk uh, with you and perhaps your family's um, uh, fortune uh, or you know uh, then um, best maybe do something else mm. um, and you might have the greatest idea but um, uh, you know they're they're all risky and so yeah th uh, that's a really important thing to ask yourself okay Thank you. Um, I do want to open it up. Um, we have a few minutes. Does anyone have a question for Neil? And I, no, I'm not sure if you need a microphone. If you want to share it, I'll repeat it out. Anyone have a question? Or if anyone on Zoom land has a question, you can type it. I have the chat here. Any questions? I have more questions. What? Yes, Mary in the back. Are you aware of the new Looney? Are you aware of the new I, Looney? Yes, I think I heard uh, just on the radio today. Yeah. Remind, remind, I'm drawing a blank right now, but you tell so us, Mary. It's going to commemorate the Klondike Gold Rush and the discovery of gold. And when the representatives from the Mint came to the Yukon to find out what the story was, they were really shocked to find out there were First Nations people involved. Yes. Oh, so we've got to change our entire story now and, and the way we're going to process this information into a loony. So there's millions of loonies going to go out into the Canadian. Economics. Yeah, right. Economics, and, and will that lead to a resurgence in tourism in the Yukon? It, it won't hurt. Yeah, it, it will. Um, I think it will help to reinforce our brand, and and with with a good a good fresh message. Um, no, it won't hurt. I haven't seen one. I haven't seen a yeah, yeah. We have so many things in uh, brand reinforcers that we're so lucky with. Uh, you know, there's the Yukon SUV. There's uh, there's Klondike chocolate bars. There's so many things because I know I've researched it um, that reinforce like that that reinforce the Yukon brand. We're so lucky. It's such a great name. It has such a strong brand. But this is a real good. Oh yeah, well. <laughs> Reality TV. Yeah. Thanks, Mary. Um. Yeah, Tracy. Um. So wonderful presentation. It was awesome. I felt like I was there. I want to go there. Um. I think I need better hiking skills first. So I don't want to be flown out. No means. Um. You talked a lot about the connection with people, and the partnerships were critical for success. In this new era of tourism post-COVID, we, we hear a lot about um, value-based and transformational tourism. We know around the world that to do tourism right and to honor reconciliation and all those things, that a lot of countries are looking at connecting tourists to the solutions, whether it's climate change or that. We talked a little bit earlier about Parks Canada and how sometimes you invite the guests to come and look at the cameras. What do you have advice, of, or what advice would you give to some new entrepreneurs in the tourism world about those concepts of pulling it together and what kind of experiences you could offer based on what you've seen in these landscapes and what could need attention to? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think um, anything that will enhance storytelling and you know, finding the stories, because those are a big part of the trophy, and um, and stories told by and and the more. Um, uh, well, uh, I'll give you an example. We worked with long ago People's Place and and uh, uh, so a couple of First First Nations couple who who were tremendous hosts and um, and but and lived and looked the the part of what they were what they were telling and they um, Harold and Meta and. Um, 
they were, um, you know, when you were in their presence, um, just being in their presence was a trophy, you know, um, and the stories they told um, were, well, at one time I had, I had some Nobel Prize winning uh, sociologists and scientists and we went there on our way to the Tatrachini and it was like they had died and gone to heaven and found the mother load with Harold and Meta. I couldn't get them out of there. They, they were, they, like they, 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 it was like they had f uh, found a lost civilization. I mean, you know, that level of, of eureka um, uh, joy that they had. Um, so if, you know, if one can enhance that as much as possible, that's, that's gold. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, sir. I just, my name's Jeff, I'm ex-military, and I just love the way your, your whole logistics, I can see it in my mind from stuff I've done in the past, from the beginnings of your career through to doing slung loads with helicopters and your guides doing hookups and doing things, and, and some of the logistical preparation and planning that we go into, I, I just think that's pretty outstanding. I mean, taking it from beginnings yeah. and then taking it to what it, what it was, I think it's... Uh, I mean, applaud you. That's, that's Thanks. quite amazing. Thank you. Pretty awesome stuff. Is that something maybe just connect to God? Have you always loved like logistics? Or is this something you had to learn? Yeah. Well, I, uh, yeah, I do have a kind of a, I, I, I like playing with that, uh, you know, and, and try improving on it. And um, but I have to say that I owe so much to all of my guides over the years because they. Um, you know, I would, uh, that was one of, so I guess, the sort of the criteria in the back of my mind that I'd be looking for with them and that they were competent with, um, besides uh, uh, attitude, their aptitude and, 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 uh, and abilities uh, matched that, those challenges. And I truly, um, you know, between, between family and, and my, the guides, some of my guides were with me for 30 years. Like a junior guide would have been with me for 10 years. You were a junior, you know, rookie up until 10 years. And, and we're very lucky with that. That, that retention was incredible. And I'm so grateful for that. But um, I was, I was, uh, I was on their shoulders. I mean, they, they, you know, carried me through the, and helped evolve those things and helped fine tune them. And um, so, but with, uh, yeah, staff and and family who uh, supported me in in the logistics and um, and and were just re reliable parts of the team that you knew. And because they would be out in these remote places, and especially before sat phones, which was half of that my career, there was no communications, like uh, smoke signals at best, really. Any, anything that you had that was make, uh, the electrical was about as good as a smoke signal. And um, so I was trusting them with everything. And uh, uh, so I, I had to depend that they were, that, that, number one, I'd given them the right resources and trained them well. And um, which was which was fun, actually. You know, uh, they they loved that. We thrived. We all thrived on it. And uh, uh, so, thank you. That's uh, uh, a real compliment. Neil, thank you. I've learned a lot. It's been a real pleasure um, tonight and getting to know you beforehand. I think for me, my biggest takeaway is um, follow your passion. And uh, one of the questions I didn't ask you was, was it the, was the river that brought you to tourism or tourism the river? Maybe it doesn't matter, but if anything, I mean, you've taken us through a ride of, of, of a bit of chaos, some beauty, um, but I feel like for me as an entrepreneur, what I take away is at the end of the day, if you're not passionate about what you're trying to achieve, you talked about a plan, but also the journey all the way through, then, then you're gonna be in trouble, so follow the passion. So Neil, thank you very much. Thank you, and John. thank you to you, Construct, for hosting, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, everybody.